Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living TV. I'm so very pleased today to have an incredible artist, Kitty Miao is her name. She is from Hong Kong. She was born in 1947. She has 11 other brothers and sisters. She studied at St. Martin's School in London and a university in Hawaii. I'm so very pleased to have her on the show. She's an artist who is doing Chinese calligraphy, painting, and she's a poet. And today she's in the studio here to talk about her work and her life. So let's take a moment to look at this video clip. Calligraphic training plays the main part in the creation of a good painting. It is the backbone of Chinese painting. The history of Chinese calligraphy is believed to be as old as China herself. It can be affirmed besides being itself one of the highest forms of Chinese art. It is, in a sense, the chief and most fundamental element in every branch of it. In Chinese calligraphy, most people probably interpreted this peculiarity in terms of scholastic discipline. It is a very personal faculty, achieved by continuous practice and meditation by a discipline that is spiritual rather than physical. In calligraphy, a good hand is the result of years of diligent and constant practice. A line in Chinese calligraphy is executed with a single stroke of the brush. It is not possible to touch up afterwards. The perfect cooperation between mind and hand, such as only can be achieved by years of practice, vitalized by an emotional energy of the artist. At the moment of writing is required for Chinese calligraphy, and it results in forms of unique individuality. In studying a piece of calligraphy painting, the first consideration is that the thing should be living, the next to discover where the life lies. Every stroke after it has fallen from the brush of the writer. It has to lie on the paper without correction. Touching up would destroy its life. The colors and thickness of the ink enable us to detect whether any touch retouching has been attempted. In the art of calligraphy and painting, described in terms of seven interrelated characteristics, which in their inseparability form a perfect whole, asymmetry, simplicity, austere sublimity, lofty dryness, naturalness, subtle profundity, or profound subtlety, freedom from attraction and tranquility, the Chinese brush, the flexibility of the Chinese brush, which can twist and curve in every direction, makes it possible for the sense of impetus and potential movement to emerge in the written characters. One, the brush is made of animal hair, tied together in small bunches and fixed into a hollow reed and a very thin bamboo stem. Sheep, deer, fox, wolf, mouse, or rabbit hair, according to the taste of the writer or the painter, for delicate characters or strokes. Rabbit hair is the most popular for bold characters. Sheep and fox and wolf hair is the finest. The ink. The ink is made of oil smoke, is black, and not made in liquid form. The soot of burned pine wood or oil smoke is collected and mixed with a kind of gum, warmed and left to solidify. It is then molded into small flat or round sticks often decorated with carved designs and characters which make them beautiful objects in themselves. Inkstone. It is a flat stone with a hollow scooped out in the middle in which the ink is ground and mixed. One end is rather more deeply gouged than the other to enable water to flow into it. Inkstones are generally made of a special rock called the red stone, which can be cut and highly polished. The surface cannot be made as smooth as glass or jade, but in the show, Victoria. Oh, thank you. So we're going to discuss your work and your life. You were born in 1947, as I said in the intro, in Hong Kong, and you had a lot of brothers and sisters. What was it like to be born in Hong Kong at that time, in that year? It, it, was, it, was, it was pretty hectic because of all the siblings. Mm -hmm. But uh, I hardly see them because the house was too big and I have to drive a toy car to find my siblings. And what did your parents do? My father was the first um, 
Chinese um, mixed Mongolian blood to open Western pharmacists. <coughs> He's a pharmacist. Yes, he and your mother? My mother was a scholar. A scholar mm -hmm. of what? Chinese. Chinese scholar mm -hmm. of history and, and... Yeah, literature, music. Literature and music. Mm -hmm. All right, so that explains where you got some of your talent from, as being the great artist that you are. You are a poet, you're a painter, and you do calligraphy. I'm also a historian. A historian. And, and, and an archaeologist. Yes, thank you. Yes, okay. So, were any of the other, other brothers talented in the way of the arts? Uh, or sisters? Not really. They are, they are sort of engineer, you know, sort of scholar, and you know, they went to Yale. And I can't remember because they were all older than me. Okay. What was going on with Hong Kong and the world at that time when you were a young girl? So between the ages of uh, five years old when you were in Hong Kong? I can't really remember. Well, you're a historian, so you should reflect back on it. Yeah, but uh, after my brain injury... I... Well, well, we'll be talking about your brain yeah, injury okay. later, but right now, uh -huh. what was happening in China and Hong Kong? Who was... Who was uh, in power at that time, when you were a young child? Was it Mao? No, Mao was later on. Later on? Yeah, when okay. I was uh, 16 or 15, the revolution. Okay, so before Mao was? I honestly have no idea. I can't remember. It was ri ri ruled by the British colony. Okay, and you were in the British section of Hong Kong? Yes. That's where you were living? Yes. Okay. So later on, uh, you were studying in St. Martin's in London, a very prestigious uh, place that, uh, of scholarly, but it's known for a lot of fashion and a lot of art comes out of St. Martin's and all the great artists, Alexander McQueen, fashion designer, many people have come out of there. You studied there for how long? Uh, since 94 to about, uh, for nine years. I have my master's degree and then uh, uh, my BA degree and master's degree. Right. Your PhD is in uh, philosophy. Yes. In, and in, your major was in art and aesthetics. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. So, of all the things you do, you're an incredible poet. I've read your poems and we're going to have the pleasure to hear some of your poems today. Which is, what do you prefer? Do you prefer the painting, calligraphy, or, or or writing as a poet? Definitely painting. Painting? Mm -hmm. How about calligraphy? Oh yes, that's the backbone. Of... That's the backbone? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's speak a little bit about the calligraphy. The calligraphy is, is an absolutely amazing um, art, and it's so old, and it's, it's really the first way of expressing uh, in, in simplicity of form and function. And the, the incredible part about it is there's no touch-up. Once you start your movement of, of, of uh, composing the figure, there's no going back and no touch-up of it. Yes, because it may, it will kill its life. And it's a continuous flow. Yes. All right. Well, let's speak about the first one in your calligraphy, which is... This is the brush of the cat. The brush of the cat. Mm -hmm. Which is the title of my okay. forthcoming book. All right, and that's the cover of your book, yes. Brush of the Cat. Mm -hmm. All right, and how long does it take you to do that? I understand that it takes maybe 50 rejections before you get the, the one that is perfection. Or more. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it took uh, two seconds to accomplish it, the speed. Okay. So, uh, if they would show the brush of the cat at this time, and then we can speak about the brush of the cat. Okay. All right. The next one is the rabbit. The rabbit. All right, so how long did it take you to do that, and how many uh, attempts to get the perfection that you were after to, to get this rabbit? At least 30 to 50, because this is very, very difficult because it, it's, it's the, it shows the, all the particular essence of the, te the technique of the calligraphy of the, you know. The and what would that technique be? Again, it's all done in one 
continuous stroke. It's not start a little bit and then stop and then no. continue on. It's you start, and where did you start to uh, compose the rabbit? Is, is there a certain place where you would start maybe at the head or do you start at the, at the body or usually when you start as a calligrapher? I usually start with the eyes because, okay. because the eye, you know, it, it gives us life and then I'll, then I'll, I'll, I'll go on one, one end and then a, 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 a spontaneous speed of intuitive leap. Yeah, and it's all done with the motion of the wrist and the fluidity of the movement and the elbow and, 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 and with your harmonized with your breath. So you're all in one with what you're doing. Exactly. I think they say here in America, they have a term here and it's called being in the zone. Yes, and, I have to be. So it's all when you have aligned your body, mind and spirit and you're in that movement and then that's going to show in that beautiful form of art that you have uh, executed. I have to become the animal myself. You have to become the animal. Mm -hmm. How beautiful. And the next one is? The camel. The camel. This is very difficult because um, of, of the of Camel was the most difficult animal to draw because to capture the face of the camel, the mouth, you know, they have strange mouth. Yes. And then the hump. And so um, this is one of my favorite because I have the technique of splitting the blush while drawing it. So it's like, uh, you know, usually the Western artists, they have to do one line and another line, but I have to come here and twist the brush to in order to attain the... Ah. So when you say splitting of the brush, the brush is separated, where there's the one brush becomes two brushes, it's fanned out. Yes, you know, okay. it's like turning the brush around. All right. And speaking of the brush, what is the material of these brushes? I it, read that they can be made from a fox or a wolf or a rabbit. The, the best is the wolf and the hare because it's steady and it's hot. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the rabbit hair is the best for the strength? No, I hardly use rabbit hair because it's too soft. Too soft? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, what do you, which one do you prefer? The, definitely the, the wolf, the wolf hair. The wolf hair? Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. All right, continuing on, the next one we have... The beavers. The, the beaver. beaver carrying the baby. The beaver is carrying the babies. Uh -huh. And it's all okay. in one stroke too, Victoria. Because it's all done in one stroke. Yes. Because, you know, I have to come here and then do an intuitive leaf to join into the baby. And um, it's, 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 it's a very difficult piece because, um, you know, you, you have to show the mothers and the baby at the same time. Okay. And the tail, you know. And, and again, this is all done in one continuous movement. You yes. never stop. I can't stop. You cannot stop. Mm -hmm. So from the minute you lay down the beginning of the line to the very end, it's one continuous movement. Yes. And are you thinking where you'd want the lines to be thicker at certain places and sometimes you want them to be thinner? Or does that just happen randomly and it's speaking to you and then you as the artist are liking that? Or well, did you plan the execution out ahead of time? I can't plan because it, it's just the brush take over my whole spirit and soul. Ah, okay. So the next one is the polar bear. The polar bear. Mm -hmm. And um, it is very, very um, different because the polar bear is difficult to capture because the head is going on the other side. And also I have to use a lot of intuitive leap because I, I, you, know, you have to have the thick and the thin, uh, you know, the, the movements. And, um, and that's part of the technique of the Okay. So when you say the head is on the other side, meaning it's 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 cocked its head to yes. look away. So how would you accomplish that in a fluent movement of not stopping? How well, did you how did you plan that and execute that out? Because that didn't just happen randomly. So you wanted that to happen. So how would you have done that as an artist? I study many many gesture and uh, 
of the polar bear and and I chose this position because the only thing is to capture the head and then I can jump into the body to finish the whole uh, completion of the paintings mm. in, in very, very powerful speed. Wonderful. But, and it took me many, many different, many, many, several times. Many, several attempts. So again, it could be 30 attempts, it could be sometimes 50 attempts until yes. you see the one that is perfection, the one that speaks to you. Yeah. It's speaking to you and you're speaking to it. It's, yes. It's, it's, a, it's the one that's got the harmony to it that, that it's totally the one without question that is the absolute one. Exactly. And I have to let go of my ego or else I'll be too involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the spirit took over and I become the polar bear itself. Ah, and you're doing this on very thin rice paper. Very, very, the best rice paper is the thinnest, the most absorbing, and it's like drawing on blotting paper. Yes, and the ink, there's a whole process to the ink too. Yes, you have to grind the ink as yes. you meditate into the particular thickness. Yes. And then you, when you dip that dip of ink, you have to visualize can that dip of ink can can provide the whole painting of the particular animal. Yes. So what I'm hearing you say is the amount of ink that you apply on the brush, you have to know ahead as a disciplined practice artist, you would have to know that you've applied enough ink on that brush. Yes. Or if you put too much or too little, you're not going to achieve the effect that you would want. Yes. Okay. Yes, and also, you know, it's like that uh, <clears throat> every every animal is different. So it's like the, the beavers and the, the polar bear, you have to have a little more ink. Yes. And the rabbit, you have the less ink. Ah, you know, and why is that? For it's, instance, the next one is what? Next one is the llama. The llama. So <laughs> how much ink would you know to apply on to the llama opposed to the other ones? What dictates how much ink of which animal? Well, when I use the brush on the stone, uh, um, uh, stone, the stone that I grind the ink, I have to make certain that when I dip on the ink stone, I have to dip enough thickness to in order to sort of um, to. It's difficult to explain. It's like for for example. Like the llamas, I have to save enough ink for this stroke, so to make it, you know, all, all the all the technique of the of of the of the calligraphic style, and um, and if I don't save enough ink, then it I can't have this fine line. So how does one go about saving the ink? Is it about the pressure that you're putting of the uh, brush onto the rice paper? Exactly. Okay, so if you apply more pressure, you're using more of the ink. Yes. So you have to be mindful that you're going to be using less pressure because you need to save it for the... The thicker one. For the thicker lines that you mm -hmm. are anticipating. Yes. Exactly. So there's a whole lot going on here. It's not just random. When you look at these calligraphy, you would think this is just a very beautiful random act. But there's a whole lot of, of logistics that are going into it too. Of, of the artist, and it's a, it's a play between between the the end result and the artist, and actually what's in the moment. Yes. So it's all coming together all at one time. And it took me eight hours a day for nine years to practice the seven different styles. Eight hours a day. Yes, yeah, so practice. eight for nine years. Eight to nine hours. Mm -hmm. On different script. Yes. From the bone and turtle script to the modern script. And how many years to get your uh, degree of your PhD? Uh, about 10 to 11 years. 10 to 11 years. Because I did a research because this, the PhD was not on the animals. It, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's it was on general calligraphy, yeah, Chinese calligraphy. And also uh, um, uh, pastel drawing because the uh, the dissertation is about. 17 tribes of exotic Jewish people in the 17th century. So I have to, it, and it has colors. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier because you can cheat. 
because these you cannot cheat or else it kills the life. So when you say cheat, what, where would the cheating be? The cheating in? will be like if I do uh, color paintings, um, you know, if you make a mistake, you can cover it by a pastel. Okay. But this you cannot cover, you cannot. So there's absolutely ever no touch up. Where yes. if you want to make this line, this thin line a little bit thicker, and later on you want to come in and touch up, you would know that you did that, but how would the viewer know that if you did do the touch up? Well, the, the, the people who understand calligraphy will, yeah. will know it. But the general viewer would not know this if you did a touch up. Well, um, they may not, but it, it kills its life. Any touch up will kill its life. Yes. Yes. And it kills its life because a very discerning eye should be able to see that this was not done in one fluent m movement. Right. Also, if I retouch it, then the, it's like drawing on blotting paper, it would become a big blot. Yes. Where that was dry and, well, I would say drier, and now you're trying to put some newer, uh, fresh ink in there, so the two of them are going to have a contrast a contrast but yeah. an effect there yes an, an undesirable effect yes exactly okay mm -hmm. well the next one the next one will be the cheetah which is a very very again the, the cheetah the cheetah yes yes is um it's the most fast running animal as you know in the wild yes and the speed is like the speed that i execute my paintings and so, um, it, so is this a cheetah in motion, or in motion. Is a cheetah in, in stillness? In motion. Ah. It's it's uh it's like um this is the piece that was accepted in the permanent collection of the Ackerman Foundation of Graphic Art and the Legion of Honor in the Fine Art Museum, mm -hmm. and um, and the curator make a statement in the in the press and say that if he blinks, the cheetah will be gone, because sometimes it's so fast that. I, I, I lost control. The brush fly away because because it's it's just it just have to be so fast and you can you can capture it. So I don't even know what I'm doing sometimes. I mean the spirit take over. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and the, the final one, but not to say that this is the final one. This is the ones we were showing. Yes. But you have how many in total? I have all hundreds, but hundreds. it's mostly and sold out. And you are about to have a book that's going to be published, a very high-end book. Yes. With a beautiful linen cover. Yes. And beautiful quality uh, paper. Yes. And uh, it's going to be showing how many animals, approximately, prints. About 36 or 37. About 36 uh -huh. or so of mm -hmm. the animal uh, prints. Mm -hmm. And this book is going to be selling for... Uh, $150 or Around so? the price for uh, 250 limited edition. Okay. And um, it's going to be 9 by 5 inches. And the mm -hmm. publisher is still, and my partner, Keith Howe, who do the prose you know, on the other side, mm -hmm. describing the habitat and the personality of the animal. Is um, you know, it's, it's going to, what was I saying? I forgot. So it's definitely going to be a collector's item book. T definitely. And Absolutely, I'm, a limited edition. Yes, okay. and I'm going to have some book, we, book signing too. Okay, and your final one is the? We talk about the hippo. Yeah, the hippo. Yes. Okay, uh -huh. so. Well, the hippo, <laughs> the hippo is strange because it's so fat. You know, yes. It's like an obese, and, and that's why I have to save enough ink to specify the, um, the 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 what do you call it? the bottom of the the body of the hippo? Yes. So so it's a, a lot of control and discipline in the ink. The discipline in the ink again, the yes. control of the ink. Where we were speaking about it before, where perhaps at the end of the stroke you would want to save the ink more there. So in the beginning, how much pressure? you're applying in the beginning to make sure that you have enough ink left on the brush. Well, which brush would you have used for the hippo? Well, the Your wolf. Your favorite one again? The, the wolf. The wolf brush. Yeah, uh-huh. Or the fox. Okay. Uh-huh. And, um, and also because I want to um, uh, emphasize the, the mouth, you know, which because they are big. And, uh, and, and, and so I have, I have to be very, very... Um, 
persuasive and on 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 where the where the thickness thickness is and then come to a, a tiny ink left to do the body and the legs. How many years ago did you accomplish these thirty six animal lithograph of uh, calligraphy? Uh, I started I guess it's over thirty years. Are you saying you made these how long ago? These are these are drawn in like a. Um, what what decade were they done? Uh, around the, the uh, late eighties or early nineties. All right. Mm -hmm. And since then, uh, you've had a car accident, and that happened in the late nineties. Yes. And this car accident caused a lot of brain trauma. Yes. Where you did you hit your head during the car accident? Yes, the the car uh, total the, the accident totaled my car and smashed my whole body. Yes. You know, squeezed my whole body into uh, you know like a non-human form. Yes. And I was pronounced dead by the, um, the the the. You were pronounced dead. Yeah, but but I was in coma. Well, this is the second time, and we'll get back to that because you were in Israel on a um, archaeological dig yes. and then you had a heat stroke and you had a near-death experience. Yes. So we'll get back to that, but let's talk about this this car accident first. Mm -hmm. So you had a near-death experience there and you... Tell me about this. What happened? The second one? The car accident. Okay. Well, I, I woke up and uh, I sort of can't remember anything. And, uh, and then they told me that I have a, a brain tumor. And um, <clears throat> how long were you in a coma? Did About two days. Three days. Two to three days. Okay. And then when I woke up, my my right arm was totally swollen, and my third finger was totally the ligament was torn, and I can't even hold a brush. And this is incredible bad news for an artist because this one hand that you're using to do your beautiful painting now is going to be a challenge. Yes. A serious challenge. Right. And I haven't touched the brush for since the accident and uh, only about a few weeks ago when I start to translate some Chinese character into this book, particular book, The Brush of the Cat, I start very, very nervous to hold yeah. on to a brush and on rice paper. So essentially you are saying that your life as an incredible artist was finished at the moment that the car accident happened? But only on single line. On a single? Oh, only on the calligraphic paintings. On the oh, calligraphy? Uh -huh. Because that takes a lot of discipline and... Because and the third finger. Okay. On the, on the uh, more Western and abstract painting, I can use other fingers. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that that is why uh, and and I got so scared and nervous that I it's like you know I'm losing my whole career. Yeah. So you're also losing your life because you you had had a trauma to your brain. Yes. From the head injury, and it took you years to come back to to uh, therapy of retraining yourself in a cognitive way to bring back your faculties of your thinking. Yes, and it's also very, it's very, um, it's a dilemma, it's very difficult because mild brain injury is, um, most people will experience it, it's, it's not as unlike other injuries. You know, people do not, they think that you're normal, but you're not. And how are you feeling you're not normal from the brain injury? What happens? Well, my memories was gone. Yeah. And uh, and and it's like that. Um, I can focus, and uh, I'm I'm. It's just I just feel that you know, um, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not I'm not functioning. Did it get uh, somewhat better since the '90s? Because now we're uh, it's uh, many years later. So. It didn't. Is it the same, or is it getting worse, or does it slowly get? somewhat better. It's slowly getting better and also as I mentioned earlier that uh, two weeks ago was the first time I have the courage to pick up a brush. I got so scared that you know I, I was so afraid. 
that uh, I can never use a brush on rice paper. You could never use it again. Not well, the way it was, though. Uh huh. But after after practicing the the characters. Yes. After practicing the character, I mean, it really oh, it, was, it was a relief to that I can hold the brush once again on rice paper. Yes. Um, I'd like you to read one of your incredible poems that you wrote. You wrote how many poems have you written throughout the last decades? Oh, I was I've written over three hundred poems in the you know, past years. Yes, so let's hear one of your beautiful poems. This was published in the Brain Injury Network. And it said, I know how to laugh wildly. To be able to laugh wildly is a pure, spontaneous outburst from the heart. One has to be in such deep suffering, transforming the depth of pain and denial into joy. One needs also to ride with the wind, leading the spirit, touching the soul to trembles. To be able to laugh wildly is the truth of being, like a child walking gently on ice, like an adult trying to be a child, like a teenager trying to be an adult. It is putting simplicity to the test. It is putting complexity to the test. It is an ultimate test of being who you are. It is a risk. It is love. It is life. What does this mean to you, this actual poem, though, if you were to give an overview of it? Well, it's, it's the truth of... Um, I couldn't even laugh because of all the fear that happened to me, and I feel that I was you know, really getting to be a little sort of retarded or you know, really lost Of my, all the limitations yes, and all the restrictions. All, all so. the things that I used to love and do, which yes. I can't. So in essence, it's saying? That once I laugh wildly, then I can express my deep suffering and, uh, and transforming the depth of pain and denial into joy. Wonderful. To be positive because we should never, never give up. We should always have hope. And, uh, and it's like uh, to, to encourage myself and others and, uh, and also you know, try to understand that more people suffer more than me. And um, and and it's uh, it's 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 very uh, it's very um, it's very emotional because you know we 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 always think sometimes that that we we are the victim but we you know but we are not because there's so many people who suffer much more much much more pain and. They're just not uh, right. talk, talking about it. And we're all connected to each other. Of course. We're, we're really, all... really not separate. We're all in this together as a human race here. We're ultimately all one. Yes. Mm. Well, it's been a great pleasure and a great honor to meet you and to know you and to enjoy your beautiful work, your art, and your, I love your poems. Thank you. And um, thank you. Thank you very, very much for being on the show. Thank you so very much, Victoria, thank for you, having Katie. me. And from the art of conscious living, do take care of yourselves and take care of others.